copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Well, Sunday, it's police calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 199. Regarding an escape criminal. Suspect described as male American, 36 years, 5 feet 8 inches, weight about 140 pounds. This man is wanted in connection with a murder and jailbreak in Memphis, Tennessee. Arrest and hold. That's all. Rose and Quest. Cafes throughout the state were widely acclaimed for their excellent coffee and all used the same well-known brand. You would, as a reasonable individual, give that coffee credit with having superior qualities not found in other brands. And if it cost you no more than the coffee you had been grumbling about, you would certainly give it a trial, wouldn't you? And that is why so many have joined the ever-growing army of motorists who always use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. The fact that Rio Grande Crack is the exclusively specified favorite of officials in 30 leading cities and counties of California means something. So does the practical testimonial of more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment being powered by Rio Grande Crack gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. And added to these highly significant facts is the happy discovery that all those as favorite gasoline are those who drive the most delivers quicker starting, even flowing acceleration, great reserve power, and a maximum of available speed. It costs no more than ordinary gasoline. All these vitally important facts have won for Rio Grande Crack, the mighty following of loyal motorists who keep their cars running more smoothly and efficiently. Cracked gasoline will convince you, too, when you give it a trial. So be kind to your motor and your pocketbook as well. On your way to work tomorrow morning, pull in at your Rio Grande dealer and get police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. It is our privilege again to present Captain C.B. Horrell, acting night chief of police of the Los Angeles Police Department. Captain Horrell. Although the case we are to hear tonight did not originate in Los Angeles, it was through the watchfulness of local police officers that the criminal was captured and returned to the scene of his conviction. This story is another example of the cooperation between law enforcement agencies in every community, which makes for violation of law an unprofitable proposition. It is significant, moreover, that every criminal involved in tonight's drama had extensive prison records. The man captured in Los Angeles was not only an habitual criminal, but a fugitive from justice, with a prison sentence outstanding against him. None of the crimes portrayed tonight would have happened had the law been enforced to its fullest extent when each man was originally incarcerated. I shall have more to say on this case at the end of the program. In a murky cafe on the edge of Memphis, Beale Street, the air rank with stale tobacco smoke and the smell of cheap liquor, a tinny piano blared out a popular tune. Shortly after midnight, two youths stroll through the swinging door. Scott, straight. Right. Damn. Right. Another one. It's true. All right. Hey, where's Phil? Over there. Uh, uh, I see him. Hey, Phil! Yeah. Come here. Just a minute. Well, what is it? Why don't you clean the stump up? It smells bad. Yeah, it might not be a bad idea. Yeah, you might start here. You keep out of this. You boys are a little junk. You better go on home. Listen, who's drunk? Hey, Lord, I see you are. But you don't, do you? Yes, I do. And what about it? You can't talk that way to my buddy. Yes, so now look, you punks. Get going. Who says so? Come on, Hank. Let's get this over with. Right with you. Get your filthy hands off of me. Okay, boys, let's do it the rough way. Oh, hey, you can't get away with that. Hit my pal, will you? I'll really. what? 
Just as welcome as you are now. You want to call the cops? I am punks now. They're out past their bedtime now. Let's get things live enough. Joe, get busy on them ivory. Okay, Phil. We're back, Phil. Stick around, Charlie. I'll show you how to handle these mugs. Yeah. yeah. Now, looks like they've got the drop on you, Phil. Yeah, it looks that way. They mean business. I saw Dean outside in the car. They drove up with her. Never mind. I don't like whispers. Yeah? It ain't polite, so cut it out. Yeah. Hey, you with the piano. Play. I said play! Hey, you might as well tap the pill, Bob. We can use it for cigarettes. Uh, get it. I'll get you for this, you rat. Stop, monkey. How's about a dance, Bob? Yeah, why not? Okay, Mark, pick him up and put him down. Come on, put some away. Idea of riding that horn. There's a dumb cop running this way from the corner. Oh, yeah? Where? Right over there. She's fixing to crawl. Let him have it, Bob. It's a pleasure. He's getting up. He's going to get his gun. Oh, no, he ain't. Get going, Peg. There's another bull coming around the next corner. Hey, you. Come back there. Stop. No. Get going, Peg. Scram. Within five minutes, the district swarmed with police officers and detectives. Most of the cafe patrons had disappeared. The proprietor, though he had seen the gunman before, was of no assistance. He had no idea as to their identity. More than 12 hours elapsed. Then an anonymous telephone call sent officers speeding to East 116th Street. There they found a man badly wounded, lying in the driveway. He had been dumped from a passing automobile. Taken to Central Station, the wounded man was identified as Bobby Walt, recently paroled from a reformatory. lingered between life and death. His indictment for the murder of the policeman did not deter his recovery, however, and weeks later he was placed in the murderer's role of the Shelby County Jail. We turn back the calendar now to the night of the raid on the cafe. In a house at 275 Rayburn Boulevard, a man and a woman are talking. I tell you, you've got to give me diamonds tonight. And I tell you for the thousandth time, I haven't got them. And where is money you got for them? What money? You sell the diamonds, no? <laughs> me sell hot junk? Say, what do you think I am? I think you're a low-life thief. I think you steal from your own mother. And I think you're going to give me diamonds or money before I go away from here tonight, or I shoot you. Hey, what are you going to do with that gun? Put it down. Now, you listen to me, you flying duckman. I'm sick of having you hang around here. First it's that daffy tale about your sister, and now it's diamonds. Now you get this and get it straight. If you ever show your face around here again, I'll blow it off. You get me? Yeah. Yeah, I get you. I give you $8,000 worth of diamonds to keep for me. You say you sell them and give me money. You lie to me. Just like you lie about my sister. You say she's free to go. But always you send men to bring her back, back here to this house to live and to do the things you make her do. No. She not come back here to live. She come back here to die. Just like you're gonna die tonight. No. I didn't do it. I didn't do it, I tell you. Keep away from me. I'll shoot you up. <laughs> <laughs> now what you do, huh? Now you got no gun. I got gun. See? Okay, wise guy. You think so? Well, what do you call this? I always keep an extra one handy. Now get going. Stop. Don't come any closer. <laughs> I told you I'd do it. And I told you I'd do it, too. <laughs> Three weeks later, in the belfry of a church on the outskirts of Columbus, Mississippi, the sexton discovered the fleeing man. Frightened at the stranger's presence in the belfry, the sexton notified officers who captured the intruder. He gave a series of names, including that of John Revensky. Sullen and morose, he is returned to Memphis and placed on trial for the murder of May Goodwin. Case of the people of the state of Tennessee, plaintiff versus John Revensky, defendant. The counsel will resume his examination. As you remember, Your Honor, Revensky had just begun his story when we adjourned. 
I'd like to have him continue from that point. Proceed. Now, John, go ahead with your story. Well, it's just like I say. I come to this country in 1916. Gave me a job in Brooklyn. I just came here from Poland. Did you have your sister with you then? No, no, she came over after. I sent for her. Is she, uh, was she the only family you had? Yeah. Yeah, she was all I have in work. Now tell us what happened then. Well, I've been here a couple years. I meet May Goodwin. She was no count woman. She keep a place in Brooklyn. She had other places in Chicago and one out on West Coast, too. Did uh, May Gooden ever meet or talk with you, sister? Yeah, yeah, she meet in Brooklyn. We go to party one night. This woman, May Gooden, was there. She see my sister, and she tell her to come see her sometime. And did your sister visit this woman? Oh, yeah, yeah, she go see her the next day. Then what happened? Oh, I don't know. I don't see my sister again for, well, many weeks. And when I do... Go on. When I do, my sister, she tell me... What did she tell you? Well, it's pretty hard for me to say, but she tell me she... she... yes? Well, she tell me she's a woman like Mae Goodwin. And she cannot leave a place where she's living. Why not? Because this woman will not let her. You mean that she was being kept prisoner in one of the places run by this Goodwin yeah, woman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you do? Well, I tried to see my sister again, but... They tell me she's gone to Chicago. Did you go to Chicago? Yeah, yeah, I go there, but I cannot find my sister. Did you ever see her again? No. No, I, I never see her again. Did you ever see May Goodwin again? Oh, yeah, I see her in Chicago. She tell me, she tell me my sister dead. Was she dead? Yeah. I found out afterwards my sister she killed herself. What was the attitude of May Goodwin at this time? What's that, please? I mean, how did she act? Oh, she very friendly. She says she's sorry for me and for my sister. And she told me she had a job she wanted me to do for her. What was that job? She wanted me to steal some diamonds for her. Did you do it? Oh, yes. Were you apprehended? What? Arrested for it? Oh, yes. Yes, I was sent to prison for it. Did you serve your time? Oh, yes. When did you see this Goodwin woman after that? Well... I went to her to get the money. She promised me for the job I'd done for her. Did you get it? No. She told me she wouldn't give it to me. Then what happened? She laughed at me. She laughed about my sister. Then uh, what did you do? What did I do? I slapped her face. Did she do anything about that? Yeah, she pulled out guns. Say she shoot me. Uh, why didn't she do that? Well, I hit her again, took gun away from her. And then what happened? She pulled another gun out of dresser drawer and shot at me twice. Did she hit you? No, no, she missed me. And what did you do then? I shot her many times. And then, well, then I run away. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, that is our defense. The recital of the prisoner was taken with a few grains of salt for the jury who returned a verdict of murder. The prisoner listened to his sentence with stoical calm and was conveyed to the county jail. Here, the threads of our story become interwoven again. Ravensky was placed in a cell in murderer's row and by a strange coincidence became the cellmate of Bobby Walsh. Unknown to authorities, certain of Walsh's jailers had been allowing him special privileges. Into the midst of this lack of discipline, John Ravensky was thrust. Hey, Bobby, here's a friend to see you. Thanks, pal. Oh, hiya, honey. Hi. Well, how are things, kid? Well, we just about got the job set. Hey, who's the new boyfriend? Uh, Ravinsky, the guy that wrapped up May Goodwin. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Well, we'll introduce us, Bobby. Yeah, sure. Hey, Rev. Uh, Come here. What do you want? I, uh, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Peggy, this is John Ravinsky, as handy a man with a 38 as you'd care to meet. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> How are you, Peggy? Not bad. You know, I think we can use him, Bobby. What do you mean? You see them bars at the bottom of the door? Yeah. Well, where about them? They look solid, don't they? Yeah, but what's that going to do? Put on one of them. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. <laughs> How you doing, eh? <laughs> My girlfriends all wear corsets. Corsets? So what? So hacksaw blades make good corset stays. 
Yeah, but but how do you get him out? I don't understand it. <laughs> oh, for the love of Mike, where do you think Bobby's been going when the guard lets him out every night? Oh. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I get it now. <laughs> hey, that's smart. <laughs> hey, you got a friend there? Yeah, huh? lay off. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. But tell me something. They let you out at night. Why you have to go to all this trouble? Thank you. You don't let me out of the jail, you dope. Besides, I got a pal who's going with me. Uh, you in with him? Me? Well, sure, why not? What do I got to lose? Okay, let's get busy. Come on, let's sing. Sing? Yeah, you got to cover up the noise the stores make. Get going. You're plenty crazy, but I'll do what you say. What are you going to sing? Well, let's see. Oh, if I had the wings of an angel, a dear Days and nights passed. The day of Walter's trial was drawing near. It was well after midnight on the morning of June 23rd when two deputy sheriffs made their routine round of the cell block for Funker Relay peering into the cell. All was quiet. Only the rasping of snores broke the stillness. They reached the heavy door leading from the cell block to the jail office. The turnkey threw back the bolts. The massive door creaked on its hinges. There was a clatter of feet on the iron floor behind them. The deputies were able to look into the muzzles of two guns. Stick them up and be quick about it. Well, come on, get there. that punch in here. Hey, get the guns, Charlie. Come on, come on, you heard him. Get in here. Come on, get in yeah. And that'll hold him for a while. <laughs> Locked up in their own jail. Hey, Bob, <laughs> we got to have more guns. I'll find him in that cabinet over there. You want to break it over? Yeah, smash it. Okay. And we'll leave by the window. The outside door's locked. That'll keep anybody else out for a while. Where'd you get the car? Uh, we're taking a taxi from across the street. Police and sheriff's officers started immediately on the trail of the two men, but they had almost an hour's start on the police. John Mullins told the officers, Yes, sir. I'll show them. There were three men climbed out of a window on the hotel side of the building. Which way did they go? Well, uh, they ran across the street and jumped into one of them taxis that parked there. You didn't happen to get the number, did you? Uh, yes, sir. I figured there was something wrong when three men slid down a rope from the jail window... So I watched where they went, and, and I wrote down the number of the car. Here it is, uh, right here. Fine, let me have that. The police rounded up the taxi driver for questioning. Did you pick up three men near the county jail about an hour ago? Yeah, I took them out to Prospect and East 50th Street. Did you see where they came from? No, I just walked up in my cab and told me where they wanted to go to. Well, what did they do when you got to Prospect and 50th? Oh, they got out and got another car, and then they drove off. Who drove? Well, there was a girl in the car. She was driving. Did you get the number of the car they transferred to? Why should I? It wasn't none of my business what they'd done. All right. That's all. Two weeks passed, and no trace of the fugitives was found. The hunt had begun to lag when two men strolled into the station and asked to see mug pictures of Walsh and his pal. Suspicious, detectives trailed the men to the office of the manager of a suburban bank. They watched the men enter the manager's office, then stationed themselves where they could listen to the conversation. Hey, this joint is going to be stuck up. How do you know? We've seen a layout, and we know the guys is going to do it. Yeah, the tough monkeys, and they won't stand for no fooling. Well, what's the idea of coming here and telling me? You have a reward for bank bandits, don't you? Well, certainly. But the men must be caught in the air. Well, if you're tipped off, you can be prepared. Yeah, where do you come in? We want a grand cash for the tip. Well, how do I know you're honest? Ah, don't worry about that, pal. When we tell you who these birds are, you'll know we're on the level. Well, who are they? If you don't mind, I'd like to get in on this. Yeah, who might you be? Oh, almost anybody. But I happen to be Detective Captain Costello. This is Officer Murphy. We've been listening to three, these two birds making your proposition. and We'd like to learn a little more about it. You ain't got nothing on us. Nobody said we had. But we're going to find out who these boys are who are going to stick up this bank. Well, what makes you think we're going to spill? Because I don't think you'd like jail any better than the next fellow. We ain't done nothing to get in jail for. Maybe you don't call this deal extortion, but I do. You don't remember me, do you? I'm the man that okayed your request to look at mug pictures of Walt and his friend Charlie. Now, unless you want to go down to headquarters and tell us there, you'll start spilling here. Okay. We'll flip you the dope. Get started. Well, we 
We happen to know that them two monkeys are living out on Quinn Street, and we know they're going to stick up this joint. We've seen the layout of the place, and we know just when they'll do the job. Where is this place? It's uh, the storied house in the corner on the left-hand side. Who else lives there? An ex Dick rents the joint. Uh, Walsh and his buddy hang out with him. Ex-detective, huh? Who is he? I only know his voice name. They call him Art. He's under indictment for something or other. He's a tough boy, too. You'd better be ready for anything. Don't worry, we will. Say, Tim, take these birds down and hold them for a while. We don't want them tipping that gang off. Okay, Chief. A few minutes after 9 o'clock, Costello and a group of officers slip quietly up to the house on Gwynn Street and surround the place. So silent is their approach that they swoop down on the man sitting on the porch, and before he's aware of their presence, the ex-detective is captured. Tim, get a couple of boys to take over on this bird. You and Bowles, come with me. Yes, sir. Come on, you. Hey, sounds like the boys are having a late supper. Yeah, sounds that way. And remember, Charlie, he ain't going to be taken alive. That's why. Yeah. Yeah, it goes for me, too. We're up for murder now. We might as well make a good job of it. Come on, let's take him. Hey, uh, hey well, one move for me to be you birds and we'll blast you. Yes, take it easy. Take it easy, fella. We ain't going to get funny. Make a grab for those guns and we start shooting, Walt. Yeah, yeah. Gather them up, Earth. Okay, Chief. Now, take out your mitts, boys. Go get them, Bowles. Put the cuffs on them. Get away from me, copper. Oh. Nice work, Bowles. He won't get tough so quick next time. Well, what are you standing there for, Charlie? Get a move on. Or do you want a smack in the jaw, too? No, no, I'll go, I'll go. Where's Ravensky? How do I know? Where's J.S. Bob? Come on, Walsh, where's Ravensky? You'll never get him, cop. He's headed for the West Coast. You think we won't, huh? That shows how little you know about police methods. Yeah, come on, boys. Load him in the car and let's get back. Our scene shifts to Los Angeles. Months have elapsed. In the central station in Wilmington, the Coleman barber is discussing the prospects of the night with his partner. Outside, the fog swirls in thick eddies around the street lamp. Motor cars pass less and less frequently. Wilmington sinks into fog-shrouded drowsiness as the two officers prepare to go on duty. Well, anything new for tonight's mini? No, things have been pretty quiet all day, according to these reports. Oh, say, by the way, have you seen my little black book? Not since last night. Why? Oh, wanted to check over some of the boys. <laughs> Always looking for excitement, aren't you? <laughs> What's exciting about taking some of these crooks that drift in here, huh? Boy, I'm telling you, you're going to wade into some bird someday who will really scramble you. Uh, I haven't seen one yet. As a matter of fact, I've never seen one of those monkeys who won't run if he thinks he's in a tight spot. Well, if I see any of them, I'll take them. But I'm not going to waste any time looking for them. Well, there's one fellow I've been looking for for a long time now. You mean, uh... Ravensky? Yep. I'm going to see that mug of his someday. Well, how come you're so bent on getting him? Oh, I'm no more anxious to get him than I am any of the others, but I've got that picture of him fixed in my mind, and I'd like to get rid of it. Now, you worry too much. Come on, let's get on the job. Okay. Oh, say, uh, what time is it, huh? Uh, five to twelve. Oh, well, we've still got five minutes. Well, give it to the city. Come on. <laughs> Look at that fog. Have a hard time catching crooks in this stuff. I never can tell what'll happen on a night like this, huh? Remember that time that we had to answer that call about the man beating up that woman? Oh, yeah. Oh. The fog was so thick they couldn't see me standing on the corner waiting for the wagon. Boy, that was a walk, bringing that guy in. Yeah, I'll see. Hey, wait a minute. I saw something move back in that door. Huh? Let's take a look. See? Right back there. Somebody getting into that cash register. Hey, you're right. Now, look, you go around the back and I'll try the front door. If he starts out here, I'll get him. If he runs out the back way, why, well, you let him have it. Okay. I'll whistle when I get around there. Hey, Barber, he's coming out the front. Hey, where'd he go, huh? Hold it. Hey, stop. There he goes around the corner. He went right through that glass door when you blew that whistle. There he is. Let him have it. Hey, stop there. Let me get in on this, will you? You got him. No, I didn't. He's still running. Get away from me with that thing. I don't want to get shot. Ah, you're not going to get hit. Here goes. 
Can't stop him. Come on. Don't, don't shoot anymore. Don't shoot. You got me. Got me back. Yeah, where you hit, guy? Oh. Hey, Smith. Shine your flashlight down here. Okay. How's that? Oh. Jumping catfish. It's Ravinsky. Oh. How proudly many a motorist declares he has gotten 50 or 75,000 miles out of his car. We enjoy the same pride in checking the speedometers of police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency cars throughout the state of California, and finding that last year these cars drove 55 million miles, powered exclusively by Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And indications are that these official cars will beat that noteworthy record this year. Join the parade of satisfied motorists who demand and get police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Turn in at the nearest Rio Grande station tomorrow morning, and while there, ask the attendant what we mean by Sinclair eyes for safety. He'll tell you that Sinclair motor oil have what it takes in this modern day of high-speed motors, that even though the weatherman goes crazy with the heat and you push your motor to the extremity of great speed, this smoother, tougher lubricant will not break down. The patented Sinclair process takes care of that by completely removing these two notorious robbers of engine efficiency, petroleum jelly and wax. Follow the trusted example of 52 railway systems, 150 major airlines, airports, and airplane manufacturers, great fleets of ships that sail the seven seas and millions of motors in 45 nations of the world. Have your Rio Grande dealer give you a refill of Sinclair Opaline, the finer lubricant, that is as smooth as it's tough, but it's only 25 cents a quart in tamper-proof cans. Give your automobile police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline and Sinclair eyes for safety with the worldwide favorite Sinclair motor oil. And now, Captain Horrell. Ravensky was removed to the hospital and later positively identified as the man sought by Memphis authorities. Through the accurate records kept by police departments in the cities affected, there was no trouble in establishing the prisoner as the wanted man. Ravensky was returned to Tennessee to pay for his crime. Thank you, Captain Horrell. Police calling all cars, attention all cars. The cancellation broadcast 199, regarding an escaped criminal. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quits.
Cause, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. California Highway Patrol calling all cars. Attention all Highway Patrol cars. Beyond